Just to let you know, this episode contains very strong language. Please be advised. <sighs> Hi, Alice. Hi, Matt. Um, just a few things before we record that we've kind of just collated into one place. Just a little bit of feedback on, on the show so far. Now we're at kind of 30 series. Whatever. Okay. Um, just the first thing that the producers really wanted me to mention was the accents, mostly amazing, um, but the women's accents could just be a tiny bit more nuanced, perhaps. Oh, Alice, don't worry your pretty little head about accents. I know what women sound like, and I think I know how to recreate them in audio form. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, okay, number two. So the pace. Sometimes it could just be that bit quicker. I think you could be a bit quicker making this point, to be honest. Possibly, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And and finally, it's just about the drama. Obviously, the writing's so brilliant, so we could maybe in the reading just sort of up the tension. Well, thanks for the totally useless feedback. Yeah. Um, I won't be taking any of it on board today, uh, or indeed in the future, because in that little envelope there, with your name on it, is your P45. I was really just saying... <laughs> uh, 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 enough. <laughs> Fourteenth of October, twenty twenty-two, Daily Star Newsroom, Canary Wharf, London. Ed Keeble dashes along the busy corridor to the newsroom. He works on the social media team at the Daily Star. He's late for a meeting with his editor, who, from his latest email, Ed suspects may have totally lost the plot. He sits down opposite Dennis Mann, a thick-set man with a round face, clears his throat. <clears throat> you wanted to see me about a... lettuce? Man shoves a copy of The Economist at him. Liz Truss has tanked the economy in seven days. According to this, it's less than the shelf life of a lettuce. I want you to live stream a lettuce and see if she can outlast it. Ed looks at him, mouth open. Does he really want him to live stream a decaying vegetable? For a brief second, Ed wonders how his career's come to this. He watches as Man points a stubby finger at him, his face dead serious. I want a sexy lettuce, a dramatic lettuce. I want you to put this lettuce on everyone's lips. A few hours later, Ed stands in his local Tesco, staring in confusion at the lettuce section. Should he go for a Lolo Rosso? Too frilly. A little gem, maybe. It's not going to stand up. I feel structural integrity-wise, not a good move. A butterhead would be fitting. Very lightweight. Might be appropriate. In the end, he grabs a robust-looking iceberg. He pays his 60 pence and takes it home. Oh, to be buying lettuce in 2022. Those prices. He sits at the dining table and stares at it. He can't just point a camera at the bloody thing and expect views. He scratches his dark beard. There's only one thing he can do. He grabs his phone and puts out an SOS call for Mr Potato Head accessories. He's elevated it. This is why he's been put in charge. Two hours later, he gives the lettuce a pair of googly eyes, a blonde wig and a sausage roll. (laughs) He stands it next to a framed picture of Liz Truss and types in Daily Star Live. Can Liz Truss outlast a lettuce? He snatches up his phone. Here's Man's gruff voice. Any signs of leaf, Will? This is ridiculous. Ed assures him the lettuce looks firm. Then he hangs up and goes to bed. Next morning, he checks the YouTube feed and almost drops his coffee. He's got thousands of views. He scans down the comments. This video streams a little gem. Oh, dear. Hope she turns over a new leaf. Boy, oh, boy. Let us hope Liz goes before she's sunk by an iceberg. My God. He picks up his phone to his editor. Congrats, Ed. The live stream's global. We've hit the news bulletins in Italy, Singapore and Argentina. Ad revenue through the roof. Just keep that lettuce alive. He punches the air, then gives the lettuce a celebratory cup of tea and some mini cheddars. He can't believe he's captured the mood of the nation with a 60 pence iceberg in a bad wig. But his lettuce only has a shelf life of 10 days. Can it really last longer than Liz Truss's premiership? He grins. 
adjusts a loose strand of hair on the iceberg's wig. There's only one way to find out. Let the countdown begin. From Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So, Alice, we ended the last episode right on the cusp of Liz Truss coming to power. And it had been amazing to see her journey to that point. Yes, and what an ascent. It was such a whirlwind. We saw her taking on the judges in her role as Lord Chancellor. We saw her jetting across the globe as Foreign Secretary under Boris, of course, using it as a way of bolstering her Instagram presence along the way. And despite a tragic demotion by Theresa May, she came back fighting. In fact, that hardened her and maybe gave her the tough exterior she needed to get to the next step. And at the same time, she's deepening that relationship with a crucial ally of hers, Kwasi Kwarteng. And they're both planning to set in motion the things they talked about in Britannia Unchained to transform the economy in a rapid and revolutionary way. When you said crucial ally, I actually thought you meant her other close companion, the salad vegetable. Oh, we'll come to that. This is episode three, Liz versus Lettuce. Hi, I'm David Brown, the host of Wondery's podcast, Business Wars. And in our new season, we're tracking the race between Google, Microsoft, and Meta to develop the most powerful AI the world has ever seen. Listen to Business Wars on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. 8th of September, 2022, 11 Downing Street. Kwasi Kwarteng shoves a box of books on the floor, leans back, gazes around his office with a look of satisfaction. He's already made his mark in the history books as the first black Chancellor of the Exchequer. And in a couple of weeks, he'll announce his first ever budget. It's going to overturn decades of Treasury orthodoxy and shake the old guard to its foundations. Chancellor! He looks up and sees one of the old guard now as Tom Scholar. Permanent Secretary to the Treasury walks in. He's slightly built and immaculately dressed in a crisp blue suit. Quasi watches him take out a timetable and push it across the desk. The Office for Budget Responsibility would like to run over your growth plan. If you could let me have the details... Quasi puts up his hand. I don't want OBR interference. He watches Scholar's mouth fall open in surprise. Well, it's a customary checks and balances procedure for every budget. Quasi sighs. This is exactly why he's called his budget a mini-budget. To avoid this kind of sluggish, counterproductive meddling. I don't need the Office for Budget Responsibility. And to be honest, Tom, I've called you in here for a reason. I wanted to tell you to your face that I don't need your services either. Scholar stares at him, shocked. I understand you may wish to change some of the old guard. Quasi suppresses a smile. He isn't changing it. He's getting rid of it. He folds his hands on the desk, looks Scholar in the eye and booms out. I'm terminating your post with immediate effect. Scholar blurts out. (laughs) You can't do that. Quasi shrugs. Watches Scholar's expression change from shocked to angry as he gets to his feet. This is utterly irresponsible, Chancellor. It's reckless and, in my opinion, dangerous. It feels outlandish to completely dismiss the professional offering of what people like Scholar are providing. Well, this is it. He's not just Permanent Secretary at the Treasury, so that allows him a level of status. He was at the centre of Britain's response to the global financial crash. This is a guy whose expertise is valuable to any government of any party and is being treated like this. A few hours later, Quasi sits next to Liz in the Commons chamber as she takes on Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, unlike the opposition, I am determined to reduce taxes on people in our country and boost economic growth. He hears a small commotion at the back of the chamber, turns to see a note being passed to the front bench. 
By the time Liz has sat down, the whole house has fallen silent. He watches her scan the note, but he can't read her expression. Eventually, she hands it to him. He reads it in shock. The Queen is ill. Elizabeth's reign is in its final hours. Quasi adjusts his purple tie, tries to look calm, but his mind is racing. The Queen's death will trigger a 10-day mourning period. All normal work in the house will be suspended. His mini-budget will have to be postponed. He's only got two years until the next election. Two short years to transform the economy and get this country back on its feet. And now, he'll have to wait. His revolution is on hold. Ten days later, Westminster Abbey. Liz takes in the hushed silence as she stands in the pulpit. She glances out at the rows of royals, world leaders and previous prime ministers. The eyes of the world are on her. She's going to prove she's a true stateswoman. She looks down at the Queen's coffin and reads, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. A few minutes later, she steps down, walks past a beefeater guard and takes her seat next to her husband. She adjusts the tiny black hat perched on her head, then glances over her shoulder. The whole row behind her is taken up with previous prime ministers. John Major, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Cameron, Blair and Brown. Each one has made their mark on history, and she's itching to do the same. Next day in the Downing Street flat, she taps her foot impatiently as she chews on her takeaway Honest Burger. Bit on the nose. She hasn't been able to move forward with her plans for ten whole days, and it's been killing her. She stares at the whiteboard, takes in the plan. Cut incorporation tax, alcohol duty slashed, no limit on bankers' bonuses. Utopia according to Liz Truss. It's good, but it's not enough. They need something eye-catching, something huge. She looks over at Quasi. He's squeezed uncomfortably on the sofa between two of her aides. She curses Boris for taking most of the furniture when he left. But she can't think about that now. She needs to look at the big picture. And that's when it comes to her, like a flash. She puts down her burger and grabs a marker pen. She writes two numbers on the whiteboard. Four and five. Classics of the genre. The highest earners pay 45% of their income in tax. She looks over at Quasi again. He's biting into his chilli burger. Quasi, can you fucking pay attention, please? He wipes the ketchup from his mouth. Looks sheepish. She takes the pen and puts a cross through the four and the five. Well, they aren't going to pay 45% of their income in tax anymore. We want everyone to keep more of the money they earn. We want to encourage enterprise, investment. We want to send the message. She writes three words on the whiteboard. Growth, growth, growth. OK, remind me why meddling with the 45p rate of tax is so contentious. So it's firstly because they're cooking this up between a small clique of them. Everyone else is excluded from this major political and economic decision. Cutting taxes for rich people at a time of economic strife is a very hard political sell. Not great optics, is it? Terrible optics. On top of that, if you want to grow the economy, you give fiscal stimuluses to people on lower incomes because they spend. Rich people save, poorer people spend. So it didn't make any political or economic sense. So for a number of reasons, it was just the completely wrong thing to do. Quasi shuffles his huge frame forwards. Looks quizzical. But don't we need time to prepare the ground? Sow some seeds so we don't get pushback? Maybe in a few months? Never thought I'd say this, but what a voice of reason. She glares at him. Don't be such a bedwetter, Quasi. We said we'd be bold, so let's be bold. 
one of her aides squeezes forward and raises his hand. Cutting the 45p rate of tax? That's risky. Tax cuts for rich people won't be popular, Liz. A very fair point, but a point that potentially will get you the sack. She gives him a death stare. We need to grow the economy. We need to be brave about this. We need to do what no one else has the guts to do. Right, Quasi? She watches him perch on the end of the sofa, polishing his glasses deep in thought. Eventually, he nods. OK, let's go all in. She grins. In a few days, she'll go down in history as the radical rule breaker. The fearless woman whose programme for government disrupted the status quo and saved the British economy. Some of that statement's true. And she's just thought of the perfect name for her plan. Welcome to Operation Rolling Thunder. Thursday the 22nd of September, 2022. The number 11 dining room. Quasi takes a tape measure to the pile of books on the dining room table. He needs it to be the exact height as the dispatch box. He's delivering his mini-budget tomorrow, his first as Chancellor. He's been working towards this moment for a decade, and he wants his delivery to be word perfect. He reads over the 45p announcement again. At first, he had reservations. But Liz is right. They have to be bold. The party will catch up in time, especially when they see their programmes working. Oh, God, I feel like a scientist in a disaster movie where I know that the meteor is going to hit Earth and I'm trying to convince all the important people and they won't listen to me. I just feel like I've got this kind of prophetic image of what's going to happen. The following day, he strides into the chamber, takes his seat on the green leather bench next to Liz touches the knot of his blue silk tie as the MPs settle behind him. He's ready for this. He stands up, plants his hands on the ornate dispatch box as the chamber falls silent. For too long in this country, we have indulged in a fight over redistribution. I won't apologise for focusing on economic growth. He stares at Keir Starmer until he looks away. Then he raises his voice over the jeers from the opposition. The highest earners in this country pay 45 pence in tax for every pound they earn. I'm not going to cut the high rate of tax today, Mr Speaker. I'm going to abolish it altogether. He hears a voice behind him. Jesus Christ. But it's drowned out by cheers from the Tory backbenchers. He smiles. He's finally giving the right wing of his party the policies they've always wanted. He looks over at the opposition. They're all speechless. It's exactly the reaction he wanted. If Labour try to oppose him, he'll denounce them as the party of envy, the opponents of growth. Liz was right to push him on this. He glances at her now, raises a triumphant eyebrow as she grins back. By the end of today, He will be headline news, and the economy will finally have the boost it desperately needs. An hour later, he's in the two-chairman pub in Westminster with his team celebrating. He holds up his pint. This is a great day for freedom. It's like they're living in a parallel universe. He's just taken a mouthful of beer when one of his aides runs in and shoves a mobile in front of him. The pound's tanking against the dollar. It's just at its lowest value since 1985. He takes the phone, frowns at the numbers on the screen, hands it back and shrugs. He's not worried. Of course, there'll be some turmoil in the markets. He and Liz knew that. But things will settle down. They'll have to, because their revolution has only just got started. Two days later, midnight. Sunday the 25th of September, Checkers. 
Liz grabs a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc from the wine cellar and heads along the dimly lit corridors of Checkers. She can't sleep. Her MPs have been sending tweets and messages non-stop since the pound tumbled on Friday. Your kamikaze budget just lost us all the red wall seats. Everyone who isn't mad hates it. Trustonomics, more like trust a fuck. Why are they so wet? Why can't they ever support her? She catches a glimpse of a portrait of Margaret Thatcher. Stops. Whispers. What would you do, Margaret? Be a conviction politician, Liz. Not a consensus one. Oh, my God. Some scenes may have been dramatised for entertainment purposes. Liz blinks. She can't believe what she's seeing, but the painting seems to be talking to her. She shuts her eyes tight, opens them again, only to see Thatcher puffing out her chest. That wasn't the first bottle of Savvy B, was it? Stay strong! Trussonomics will save this country, so put on your pearls and show them who's boss. I have to say, this is a bonkers departure from usual proceedings, but I'm loving it. Liz's eyes glisten. She can't believe she's talking to a painting, but she's just glad of the support right now. Wherever you can find it. She heads to the TV room, sinks into a floral armchair, and watches Laura Koonsberg interviewing Quasi on catch-up. She sips her wine as Koonsberg asks him about tax cuts for the richest people. There's more to come. We've only been here 19 days. She smiles. He's right. She feels herself relax. She puts on her favourite DVD, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. With a gun to my head, given a hundred guesses. Never. Half an hour later, Liz is laughing hysterically as Ferris hops into a Ferrari when Quasi rings. The Asian markets have ditched the pound. It's like a fire sale. Fuck! I expected a bit of market turmoil, but this... Are we in trouble? 6am the following morning, she sits with Quasi in his office in number 11. Sips a strong coffee as the Treasury Chief Economist shows a series of graphs on the effects of Friday's mini-budget. Liz stares at a red line pointing to the floor. The pound has continued to fall and is now at its lowest rate ever against the dollar. Now, I'm no pro. Um, that's quite bad, isn't it? She looks at a blue line pointing up. OK, this sounds good. The impact on interest rates is rather seismic, I'm afraid. Government borrowing is already severely impacted. We're also seeing the start of a pension liquidity issue. Right. A sudden silence fills the room. It's broken when one of her aides walks in and hands her a note. Libra have surged ahead 33 points. Again, I'm not an expert, but um, we don't love to see that, do we? No, but that means there are 67 other points up for grabs. <laughs> OK, so let's all stop being so glass half empty. Liz orders everyone out. When they've gone, she sits, staring at the graphs. Eventually, Quasi says, Uh, maybe we should roll back, Liz. Revisit the 45 pence stuff. She shakes her head, thinks about what Thatcher said to her yesterday. If we change now, the markets will punish us even more. We can't look weak. No U-turns. She watches him rub his eyes. Liz, I I'm not sure how long I can hold off the party on this. Oh, for God's sake, Quasi. Let me think. But she knows he's right. She refuses to back down. But she can't fight this on multiple fronts. And the party conference is only days away. She needs to get out there, tour the airwaves, defend her policy. And she's also had an idea. No. She's going to find an ally. A big personality. Someone who can help unite the party behind her. And she thinks she knows just the man. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. We bring to life some of the biggest controversies in U.S. history. Presidential lies, environmental disasters, corporate fraud. In our newest series, we look at the tragedy in Jonestown, where over 900 Americans were found dead in a settlement carved out of the South American jungle. 
The residents of Jonestown had been members of a religious group known as the People's Temple, and their leader, Jim Jones, had promised that they were building a utopia founded on socialist principles. Jones' focus on progressive politics had earned him thousands of followers in California while helping him forge relationships with powerful elected leaders. But Jones and his congregation also faced charges of abuse, and as the People's Temple faced a growing number of investigations, Jones asked his followers to perform the unthinkable. Follow American Scandal wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Thursday, the 29th of September, 2022. Michael Gove's office, Westminster. Michael Gove shuts his laptop. He's been trying to prepare for the party conference, but he can't stop listening to Liz Truss's local BBC radio interviews. She has that effect. I mean, this was such a day in our history. Wasn't it incredible? I listened to every single one. So did I. It was like a concept album. Yeah, if the concept is it's just stuck on one track over and over again. It's the first round of interviews she's done since she launched her assault on the economy. And she sounds shaky. I'm growing the size of the pie so that everyone can benefit. He winces as the presenter jumps in. What, by borrowing more and putting our mortgages up? He listens to the dead air. Oh, for goodness sake, Liz, see something. He switches off, turns to his Twitter feed. I don't think there'll be solace there. Reads a tweet from historian Dan Snow, describing her radio interviews as the biggest mess since autumn 1216, when King John, dealing with a rebellion and two invasions, caught dysentery in Norfolk, lost the crown jewels in the wash and died in Nottinghamshire. Hard to spin that. He looks down at a message from Downing Street. The PM would like to invite you to number 10 for a chat. Can you come today? Is that ever good? I mean, that's the equivalent of, in the margins of your homework, please see me. Oh, absolute chills down the spine. He leans back and taps his pen on the desk. He and Liz have hardly spoken since the leadership campaign. Not since he'd called her plans a holiday from reality. Maybe now that the vultures are circling, she's ready to see sense. An hour later, he stands next to an ornate marble fireplace at number 10 as Liz hands him a glass of wine. He looks at her earnestly. The best thing you can do now, Liz, is reverse the 45 pence tax cut immediately. She smiles at him. We're not here for that, Michael. I'd like to offer you an ambassadorship. Israel or China? You choose. He stares at her, utterly dumbfounded. An ambassadorship? The economy's tanking, and that's what she's called him here for. He opens his mouth to reply when she cuts in. You don't have to decide yet, Michael, but I would value your support. Think it over. A few days later, he's on the panel at the Laura Koonsberg show. He shifts under the studio lights as he watches Liz being interviewed by Koonsberg a few feet away. I understand people's worries about what has happened this week, but I do stand by the package we announced. He stares open-mouthed. She's unbelievable. Inflation soaring, interest rates are shooting up, the economy's on its knees, and she can't see any of it. He watches Koonsberg turn in a seat and face him. Michael Gove, what do you make of that? Some really interesting nuggets in there. He catches Liz's eye. It's one thing to oppose her policies, but going to war with a new Prime Minister on national TV on the eve of conference is another matter entirely. It could be career suicide. He glances over at Liz, then tells Koonsberg, I'm profoundly concerned. Cutting tax for the wealthiest when people are suffering, that is a display of the wrong values. There needs to be recognition at the top of government of the mistakes made. He looks at Liz. She glares back, furious. He's drawn his line in the sand. He's going to do everything he can to stop this woman before she destroys his party and the country. 
9.15 that night. Malmaison Hotel, Birmingham. Quasi heads across the hotel lobby. He's desperate for something to eat. He spent the day holed up in his hotel room working on tomorrow's conference speech, his first as Chancellor. He glances around now to make sure there aren't any journalists waiting to pounce. He's had enough of defending the 45p tax cut for one day. He's just reached the lift when a backbencher stands in front of him, his face red with anger. A £1 billion windfall to the richest people in the country? Who the fuck thought that was a vote winner? Quasi pushes up his glasses. He's too hungry to argue back. I know that feeling so well. He wearily tells him the same thing he's been telling MPs all day. It was a joint decision between the Prime Minister and myself. We both stand by it 100%. The 45p cut is staying. The backbencher stares, eyes bulging with rage. Well, I hope you'll both be fucking satisfied when we lose the next election. Quasi takes a breath and steps into the lift. 20 minutes later, he's just about to take a mouthful of steak when one of Liz's aides appears at the doorway. You'd just be like, please, let me just have five minutes of pretending I haven't tanked everything. Also, I think just a general rule for the workplace. If someone's eating, don't disturb them. No, come on. Five minutes, just let me eat these baguettes, finish the pasty and the cake, and then I'll be with you. Why were you on a diet? (laughs) The aide holds up four fingers, then five. Okay, we've seen this before, but in whiteboard form, go on. Quasi sighs, pushes away his plate. He can't even eat without the 45p cut interrupting him. A few minutes later, he gets out of the lift at the Hyatt, heads to Liz's suite, just as Sir Graham Brady, chairman of the 1922 committee, comes out. Now, we heard about these guys every day for a while. Yes, so the 1922 committee is the group of Tory backbench MPs. It's all Tory backbench MPs. And Sir Graham Brady, as chairman of it, is given a lot of power because when he speaks, he's speaking on behalf of the entire parliamentary party. Quasi nods at him, but his heart sinks. A visit from Sir Graham is usually bad news. He waits until Brady is out of earshot. What did the Grim Reaper want? Liz looks at him, ashen-faced. The 45p rate, Quasi. It's as dead as a dodo. The party are against it. We need to rip off the plaster. He stares at her, horrified. For fuck's sake, Liz, I've been defending the damn thing all day. I even did a bloody press conference. The timing is regrettable. He trails off, then adds... It's the cornerstone of my fucking speech tomorrow. But I think as long as you've measured the height of the dispatch box, it'll be fine. She looks away. Too late. I've already promised Brady. The party are too unhappy. It's gone. Quasi sinks into a chair, stares at her in disbelief. You wanted to fucking keep it, not me. The least you could have done is consult me. She snaps back. I think you're forgetting which one of us is PM. His stomach turns, but it isn't with hunger. He's livid, but there's nothing he can do. He gets up and storms out. Quasi stands outside the door, trying to steady his breathing. He's going to be torn apart by the press. All he can do is take the hit and try and save what's left of their revolution. Three days later, Wednesday the 5th of October, Birmingham. Liz strides confidently onto the stage at the Tory party conference. Oh boy. Grins out at her MPs. She's determined to give this speech everything she's got and win back her party. She clamps her hands on the lectern. I am ready to make hard choices, but the status quo is not an option. She blinks out at the muted response, throws open her arms. I have three priorities for our economy. Growth, growth and growth. She waits for the rapturous applause, but there's just a few feeble claps. Okay, tough crowd. 
She turns at the sound of a scuffle, sees two women hold up a Greenpeace banner. She frowns as security escort them away. I see the anti-growth coalition arrived early. To be fair, quite quick for her. Liz senses an opening. I was going to talk about them later, but let's do it now. There is a change in the room. All eyes now fixed on her. She grins with delight. This is her bread and butter. She could be back at Oxford. She launches into an attack on others in the anti-growth coalition. Labour, the Lib Dems, people who take taxis from North London townhouses to the BBC to dismiss anyone challenging the status quo. And podcasters. OK, look, politics in this day and age has got nasty. It's got dirty. And I think that people say things to shock, to polarise, but really... That was below the belt. We can't speak for all podcasts. We simply can't. But that is possibly the worst thing, the most prejudiced thing I think any politician in this country has ever said. To incite hate against some of the most noble, the most talented, the most hard-working people in this society, I think is abhorrent. Oh, I mean, some podcasters work their socks off, sometimes for up to three hours a day. Three, <sighs> two, three hours a day. That night, she swirls around the dance floor at the Tory party LGBT disco with Therese Coffee. You've got a little nickname for her, haven't you, Matt? Therese interest rates more like. Cool. OK. Well, or not. I just say I don't have one. Therese, and her middle name is interest rates more like, and holds the coffee and the price of... OK, all right. OK. Yeah. Therese, and then in inverted commas, interest rates more like, and the price of, close inverted commas, coffee... Maybe it works better written down. Hmm. Getting rid of the 45 pence cut was hard, but she's still got the rest of her growth agenda. And she's finally back on track with her party. A few minutes later, she's at the karaoke machine with Therese, belting out, girls just want to have fun, while Therese puffs on a cigar. It's just like the old days with Quasi. I hate the old days. Right now, she feels that same optimism. She's weathered the storm, and now it's finally time to lead. A week later, she's in the Cabinet room, sipping strong coffee as Cabinet Secretary Simon Case and the new Head of the Treasury, James Bowler, walk in. She hasn't really got time for these Whitehall pen pushers, but they've asked for an emergency meeting. She watches Bowler adjust his wonky tie. He looks at her through thick, dark eyebrows, starts talking about an OBR report. She sighs, checks her watch. Then she hears, they've just reported a £72 billion black hole in the nation's finances. She looks up, shocked, grabs the report from him. That can't be right. She and Quasi went over the figures. She stares at the report, but the numbers swim in front of her. Prime Minister... We're on the brink of a catastrophic meltdown. No amount of spending cuts will solve this. We need urgent action. Her heart thuds. She feels sick. She's just scraped through the 45p debacle. But this... She stares at the report. Feels her vision narrow as panic takes hold. She orders everyone out. Then grabs her phone. Normally... She'd just turned to Quasi for advice. But he's at an IMF meeting in Washington. So she rings Therese, tells her what's just happened. She listens to the long silence on the other end, then hears Therese's voice. The party will want blood for this, Liz. She hears her own voice shake. Uh, what do I do? You need to decide. Do you give them your blood? Or Quasi's? Brutal. She puts her head in her hands. Quasi's her biggest ally. She can't sack him. But she can't resign. Not like this, in total failure and humiliation. One of them will have to go. And she'll have to make a choice. Her? 
or quasi. 14th of October 2022, Downing Street. Quasi's car races down Whitehall and pulls into the large iron gates of Downing Street. He's been called back from the US by Liz to try and fix the £72 billion black hole. He spent most of the journey scouring social media. He's read tweet after tweet discussing his imminent sacking. It can't be true. Liz wouldn't betray him. It's unthinkable. He strides into number 10, ignores the excited shouts from journalists, heads into the cabinet room. Liz turns to greet him. She looks pale and gaunt. I'm so sorry, Quasi. This is so painful. He stares, aghast. This is so shocking. So it's true. He sinks into a chair. His limbs feel like lead. He listens as she tells him over and over how sorry she is. He cuts in. Who's replacing me? Her bottom lip trembles. Jeremy Hunt. He sits up, horrified. Jeremy fucking Hunt? The establishment in human form? She looks like she's going to cry. They've pushed me into a corner, Quasi. There's nothing I can do. You could fight for me, Liz. Fuck's sake. I've defended you over and over. The 45 pence tax. You didn't listen to me, but I stuck by you. He watches tears spring to her eyes. And now you've thrown me to the wolves. I can't believe you're so weak. He sees his words sting. He runs his hand over his head. You'll be a lame duck, Liz. You'll be fucking history. Quasi gets up takes one final look at her, then storms out. Outside, he forces himself to smile and raise a hand for the cameras. That classic walk of shame. He's not going to let them see how crushed and humiliated he is. He's been Chancellor for 38 tumultuous days. No Chancellor has ever been sacked so soon after taking office. And none of them have left with their reputation in shreds like this. Don't worry, though, because I think there might be a new story coming which will eclipse it. But that's not what's killing him right now. Liz's betrayal has cut him deep. He thinks back to their early days, back on that park bench in Greenwich years ago, making a pact. He thought then she'd be a strong leader, a reformer. But he was wrong. She's ripped up everything they stood for in Britannia Unchained. As far as he's concerned now, She's a dead woman walking. Three days later, House of Commons. Liz strides through the corridors towards the chamber, adjusting her cream blouse under her navy suit. She's determined to regain control during today's Prime Minister's questions and prove to her party that she's still a strong leader. She looks down at her phone and sees a trending tweet. Daily Star Live. Can Liz Truss outlast a lettuce? She stares at the lettuce. It's got googly eyes, a blonde wig, and it looks like it's been eating a Greg sausage roll. It's pathetic and puerile. It's not even funny. But let's stop reading reviews for your Edinburgh show. Let's get on with this, shall we? Yeah, also, can you stop writing reviews of my Edinburgh show? (laughs) Never. She'll be damned if she lets this rattle her on top of everything else. She puts her phone away, taking her seat on the green leather bench. She sits, stony-faced, as Starmer lists all the policies that have gone under new Chancellor Hunt. Behind him, Labour MPs yell, Gone! with every policy he reads. They're all gone. So why is she still here? She jumps to her feet, spits out. Mr Speaker, I have been very clear that I am sorry. I've made changes. And now I'm going to get on with the job of leading the country. I am a fighter and not a quitter. She sits down, takes in the cheers behind her. She's going to lead her party into the next election if it's the last thing she does. 
Well, let's, let's be careful about how we phrase these things, shall we? She's making her way back to Downing Street when one of her advisers catches her up. Prime Minister, Labour have just raised a vote of no confidence in you. She feels her shoulders drop. For a second, she wonders if it's all over. But then she remembers the lettuce. She turns on her heels, rushes back to the Commons. She's going to fight, just like she said. Get her party behind her, win this vote, and beat that bloody lettuce once and for all. 11.30 that night, Downing Street flat. Liz trudges into the kitchen, reaches into the fridge for the remains of a large pork pie. She grabs a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc, slumps down at the table and grabs the TV remote. It's been a night of astonishing scenes at Westminster with reports of jostling, manhandling and bullying in a supposed vote of confidence in the government. The Deputy Chief Whip was reported to have left the scene saying, I'm absolutely effing furious. I just don't effing care anymore. She looks at her phone, checks on the live feed of the lettuce. She's been secretly watching its progress. Right now, it's in a tiny hospital bed under the caption... Lettuce Liz on leaf support. I would have such a colossal sense of humour bypass if this happened to me. She gets up and stares out of the window. If she doesn't come up with a plan soon, her party will chase her out of office. She takes a long gulp from her glass. There's only one way out of tonight's mess. It's risky. But if there's one thing her career has taught her, it's to take risks and be radical. Where's that exactly? Can I see the data for that? She has to try. Nine hours later, she sits opposite her chief whip, Wendy Morton. She tells Wendy that last night's disaster was all her fault. You completely failed to make it clear to MPs what was at stake. I'm replacing you immediately. Wendy glares at her, gets to her feet and plants her fists on the desk. I am the chief whip. I'm not going anywhere. And if you try to sack me, the whole whip's office will walk out. Liz jumps to her feet. I'm the fucking prime minister. If I say you're sacked... But Wendy's gone. She didn't even get her last singer in. Liz slumps back into her chair. She sits up, stares at the door. Expects Wendy to walk back in and apologise. But it isn't Wendy. It's the Grim Reaper himself, Sir Graham Brady. He's wearing a dark suit and his face is solemn. Her heart sinks. He's the last person in the world she wants to see. He sits down and folds his hands. I'm sorry, Prime Minister. I've had a cascade of letters, emails and WhatsApp messages overnight calling for you to go. You don't need to list all the modes of correspondence. I think you just need to say we've had communication to this effect. It's a bit humiliating. Verbal, virtual, (laughs) written down. You name it, they've done it. I've had some diagrams. Paintings, for God's sake. (laughs) Her mouth dries. She tries to sound calm. Is the situation retrievable? He shakes his head. I don't think so, Prime Minister. When he's gone, she sits for a few moments staring into space. Her long battle with her party is finally over and her defeat is total and humiliating. She picks up her phone, calls her husband Hugh at work and asks him to collect their daughters and come to Downing Street immediately. Then she opens her laptop and starts to write the most difficult speech of her life. Two hours later, she stands at the lectern looks at the ground and wills herself not to cry. She stares for a few seconds at the marking tape. It's still there from her acceptance speech 44 days ago. No, I mean, of course it is. She takes a breath, then blinks up at the wall of cameras. From my time as Prime Minister, I am more convinced than ever we need to be bold and confront the challenges we face. As the Roman philosopher Seneca wrote, it is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that they are difficult. 
Seneca's estate being like, can you not involve us in this? Someone yells, you gutted the lettuce one, Prime Minister. She turns away and heads back into Downing Street for the last time. Her aides and staff line the corridor and applaud her. But everything she's ever worked for is gone. Her partnership with Quasi, her dreams, her ambition, it's all ended in economic disaster and international ridicule. She stands in the corridor, shocked and bewildered, grips Hugh's hand tightly and hears herself mutter, at least I was prime minister. Liz Truss's premiership is the shortest in British history. She was replaced by her arch-rival Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister shortly after leaving Downing Street. She remains MP for South West Norfolk. In April 2023, she delivered the Margaret Thatcher Freedom Lecture and she's available to book as a speaker on subjects as varied as economic growth, the future of conservatism and leadership. And Gaul. Kwasi Kwarteng is the second shortest serving chancellor in history, serving only 38 days in the post. Since his sacking, Kwarteng has set up his own consultancy firm and remains MP for Spellthorn. In an interview on Times Radio in September, he reported that he hadn't spoken to Truss in a couple of months. The lettuce showed mild signs of discoloration and suffered some wilting of its external leaves, but was crowned winner, given a glass of bubbly and a party popper and some disco lights. Meanwhile, Liz Truss's photo was flipped over and remained on the table, face down for the rest of the live stream. Later, the lettuce's image was triumphantly projected onto the Houses of Parliament. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. Before we go, make sure you join us next week for a very special interview episode. We're going to be discussing Liz Truss with Alistair Campbell and Joe Lysett. It is the duo that you didn't know you needed. This is the third episode in our series, Liz Truss. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Out of the Blue by Harry Cole and James Heal, Let Us Rejoice, an article by Jim Waterson for The Guardian, and you can listen to 49 Days of Liz Truss, The Inside Story, a podcast by Politico. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samizdat Audio. Karen Laws wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Our sound design is by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. This episode was produced by Millie Chu. Our associate producer is Francesca Gilardi Quadrio Corsio. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our series producer is Theodora Leludis for Wondery. Our executive producers are Rich Knight, Jessica Radburn and Marshall Louie for Wondery.